Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and welcome to Walk In My Shoes, an initiative of Congress and Cassie. And uh, I want to thank you all for attending tonight. It's a full house, even if you had a bigger venue, you probably would have fitted more people in. But you are here tonight because you care about this issue and it's an issue that uh, affects us, an issue that we've talked about for many, many years. Tonight we're going to talk some more about it. Tonight we have a wonderful panel uh, assembled here in front of us, ladies and gentlemen, seven great panel members, two of them from uh, overseas, and uh, I'm sure we'll generate lots of discussion from there. I encourage you to be part of the discussion tonight. There'll be a couple of roving mics going around. I'll, I'll ask you, uh, please, to keep your questions short, and if you want to make a statement, that's fine, uh, but please keep the, the, the statement short as well, because a lot of other people want to have a, a discussion tonight. So I'll ask you please to uh, remember that throughout the night. My name is Charlie King. I'm standing in for Olga Havenen, who was uh, originally the MC facilitator tonight, but due to her family illness, she's unable to be here. Our thoughts are with uh, Olga and her family and hope things work out for her. But it's great to see so many people here, uh, I must say. I'll introduce the panel to you a little later on. You will be impressed by them. We'll ask them to uh, uh, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about why they want to be on this panel uh, tonight. There's some questions prepared, uh, about eight questions, but uh, a lot of the uh, discussion, I think, will come from the floor, and we encourage you, as I said, uh, to do that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Des Rogers, who's the Deputy CEO of Congress, to tell you a little bit more about this wonderful initiative of Congress, uh, but also to introduce tonight. Mr Des Rogers. Okay. Thanks very much, Charlie. Um, welcome, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people here. So I just want to tell you a bit of a, give you a bit of background. Um, the walk in the shoes, and you can see up there there's a thong and a barefoot. You probably want to know what's the story behind that. You can see footprints in the sand there as well. I was at a community a number of years ago uh, talking to somebody in the community in, uh, in actually the school, and a young lady, young local Aboriginal lady, was a receptionist, and um, she said to the principal, oh, I'm just going to go for lunch. So she got up, and as she was walking out, I noticed she only had one thong on. And I said to her, oh, what's happened to the other thong? And she said, oh, I'm not too sure, you know, probably my sister's got it or someone. And I said, isn't it uncomfortable with just one thong? She said, well, one thong's better than none. So I think that sort of says it all from an Aboriginal perspective. Um, now, we, we don't want tonight to be a talk fest. Um, we, Johnny Little's in the audience in Congress. He runs, he's the manager for Nginja. Uh, we run a summit out at uh, Ross River in 2008. We had to stop the violence campaign in 2010. And in 2013, about uh, seven or eight weeks ago, we had another national male health conference out there, or summit out there as well. Um, so there's been a lot of talk, and that last uh, summit, the theme was it was time for action. So that's what tonight's about. Um, I'm just waving to somebody up there who's going to do something, I think. Hello, thank you. There has been no conversation with the elders and the Canberra mob in there. So we got our own Canberra mob in the bush. In terms of um, culturally appropriate services uh, that deal with local cultural context uh, is, is really important and I think that um, you know, dealing with um, safe places and access issues for males um, with the ability to access services is, is equally important. Please, listen to us. We need more men, men centres out there. We need, to, we need to heal the men up to get back to the head of the family so we can control the family, teach the kids. So there, that's a one-minute uh, DVD. It's produced by uh, Chris Tangy, who's down, sitting down the front here tonight. Um, and we've done, he's done three other uh, one-minute DVDs, a three-minute DVD and a seven-minute DVD. And the idea of those DVDs is to send them out uh, to communities and send them to politicians and actually tell the story, rather than just pamphlets and that. Now, up there on the screen, uh, Congress put into ABA, the Aboriginal Benefits Association, 
uh, an application for $250,000 to purchase what we call a health promotional vehicle. Because Congress auspices five communities around uh, Alice Springs, Amungra, Santa Teresa, Mutajulu, Uchu and Ndari. Um, the $250,000 is all we could ask for, because that was the maximum. It was pretty hard writing the application because normally, as most people in the audience would know, when you write an application, you normally base it around a program. But we wanted to be innovative and uh, we didn't base it around a program because the idea with this vehicle is we'll go out certainly to those five communities I mentioned, go out for three or four weeks at a time and actually engage with all of the community members, the children, the women and the fellows and uh, talk about the issues that they face. And all of you people in the audience would know that that list would be long and complex and drill it down to one or two things. Now, that could be anything. It could be violence, it could be alcohol, it could be mental health, it could be suicide, it could be whatever. Then the idea is to go away, get the experts, so to speak, in, that work in those areas, go back to community and let the community be a part of the engagement. So people would have heard, heard of grassroots um, programs. Well, this is really going back to grassroots um, because I believe strongly that uh, the only way to make change is to actually genuinely engage, particularly with community people. Um, so we need to raise another $140,000 to purchase this vehicle. Um, so we had a similar function in, um, in Melbourne last week um, and we had a really big red box. Um, a really red box, you would have seen the Imparja TV in that real big box that's sitting on the beach and that. So we had a box that big. And we asked people in the audience to contribute towards this truck. What a great initiative. This is a one, one in a lifetime opportunity and people contributed uh, significantly to that. And I don't know, I think we're still counting the money. We raised a significant amount of money. Somebody said today it was $1,000. I think it's more like $10,000. So tonight we've got an orange box here. And it's a lot smaller, as you can see. And it only takes notes, it doesn't take coins. So we want you to contribute towards the purchase of this vehicle. So Because what we're doing up there, you can see one of our programs is Headspace. Um, the big logo on the back. Um, I'm trying to sell it to Headspace. I sent a email to the CEO from Australia a week ago to Headspace and said, look, this will only cost you $50,000 for that sign. I don't know, I don't think he's got the email because he hasn't responded yet. On the side of the truck, 25000 The smaller one's 15000 So wouldn't it be great to have the Alice Springs Town Council logo on there, Damien? <laughs> <laughs> or McDonald Shire. Or Ross Engineering. So, you know, fantastic. So we're going to pass this around. We'd like you to fill it up with notes. Um, you know, the blue ones, the red ones. What's the hundred dollar? What colour is that? I've never seen Green. one of those. Green. So whatever. So I'm going to pass it around shortly. Um, but I'd also like to invite uh, a lady by the name of Pamela and Nathan to come up from Cassie, because we're a very fortunate organisation, Congress, where Cassie is contributing a significant amount of money um, to Congress over the next five years. So I'll ask Pam to come up and say a few short words. Thank you. Uh, look, just on behalf of Cassie, we're really delighted to be co-hosting this forum tonight, this really important forum. And we're also uh, very privileged to be working alongside Congress for the next five years, working on issues of violence and trauma to save lives and change minds and to uh, make my spirit inside me good, Kuranamwara. And we look forward to tonight. Thank you. So thanks very much, Pam. Um, so I'm going to pass this box around. You know, take your time, dig deep, contribute to this wonderful initiative, and uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Des. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen, the box uh, going around. Um, don't leave here with our money in your pocket, I guess is the, the thing. Put it in that uh, box there before you go. You'll feel better for it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, uh, would, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Aunty Barb Sator to, uh, to provide a welcome to country. Aunty Barb Sator, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I'm a bit nervous. I'm still on cloud nine with the mayor and my cousin brother up there. <laughs> I always got to put in the football. 
Uh, yeah, it's it, it's great to see a good crowd here, and um, by the looks of this paper, there's quite a few significant identities here. I suppose that's the word. I'm not used to big words. Uh, but welcome the uh, overseas members for this forum and uh, the panel, fine panel by the looks of people. I know most of them. And uh, I think I know a few that had light shining in my eye in the crowd. It's good to see a, a mixed lot of people here. And um, I'm, he I'm here with my sister Pat, the Deputy Administrator, Mrs Pat Miller. I better put that in. And um, yeah, and uh, with this issue, there is a lot to be done. So I really hope that the panel can work out some solution for what's been going on. We see it every day and night around the town. And in my honest opinion, it's not amongst the indigenous people at all, it's amongst everybody. I've witnessed a lot of it, non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal. And um, it's amongst the ge younger generation and the older ones seem to get the blame for it. But I'd, I'd really like to see a good response to this forum and help the Congress and CASI uh, organisations to really do a good job. So welcome everybody to my home. I hope you love it. Thank you. Thank you, Aunty Barb. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, wouldn't it be amazing if uh, right around Australia tonight we had gatherings like this, all around Australia where groups got together and did uh, what you're doing here tonight, looking at this issue of, uh, of family violence. Uh, wouldn't it have been incredible if during the lead up to the federal election, if just one one politician, one candidate came out and said, this is an issue that I want to tackle if you vote for me. So they're the things I think that we need to, to uh, encourage people to do. We need to find a voice. Please find your voice tonight. There are no bad ideas, you know. Suggest what you want to suggest. We'd love to hear all of them. So please be encouraged to do that. Can I acknowledge the great work that uh, Congress have done encouraging men to stand up against family violence, and led by you, Des, and Johnny Little, who you mentioned before, and those meetings that happened down at... Uh, Ross River is just the start of this wonderful movement of men, I think, right around Australia, as men start to say, we have a role in, in all of this. And tonight I want to be able to, uh, to talk to our panel about that. And what a panel we have here, ladies and gentlemen. Look at them, seven, uh, seven talented people, all with uh, wonderful thoughts to share with us tonight. And I want you to connect with them. Make that effort tonight, won't you? Let me introduce them, and then I'll ask them to just say a few words about themselves and, and uh, their position on this. First of all, uh, here at uh, this end of the table is the Mayor of Alice Springs. He's been the Mayor since 2008. He was born in Alice Springs. He has his heart here. Ladies and gentlemen, Damien Ryan. Thank, thanks for that welcome, Charlie, and uh, thank you to Barb for your welcome this evening. Um, I'd start out by acknowledging the Central Island of people who are the traditional owners and custodians of Alice Springs. As Charlie said, my main job is as the Mayor of Alice Springs, and Alice Springs is a very uh, diverse community. Um, I feel very threatened up here on this panel this evening when I've read their, all their resumes, so uh, I'm very interested to see the conversation and, and where it goes this evening, but as has been stated, we need to all live together to have a good life. So thank you for coming along this evening. Damien, thank you. Uh, sitting alongside uh, Damien, ladies and gentlemen, is Justice Jenny Blockman. She's a Northern Territory Supreme Court judge. She's been a judge for three and a half years. Prior to that, she was a chief magistrate, she was a magistrate, and she was a lawyer. She's had a wealth of experience in this particular field, but of course, from the, from the bench. Uh, Jenny, welcome. Right. Thanks, Charlie. Um, well, look, my uh, interest in this area is to find out whether there are um, things happening in the community that will make a difference to uh, violence against women, uh, in particular Aboriginal women, because although this family violence issue can genuinely be said to be a multicultural issue, 
uh, the statistics in the Northern Territory speak very strongly to the fact that the vast majority of uh, victims of particularly interspousal violence are Aboriginal women. Uh, I do a lot of jailing, particularly of Aboriginal men. I don't take any pleasure in that, uh, but it is necessary for protection, short term. It's not actually sh uh, solving the problem. I say short term, some of it's long term, of course, for very uh, serious assaults and worse, uh, but uh, half of uh, Alice Springs Jail is um, comprised of men who have assaulted their intimate partners. So it's a pretty significant problem and I'd like to learn a bit more about it and make some suggestions for alternatives. Terrific. Thanks, Jenny. We'll hear from you uh, a little later on. Uh, and sitting alongside Jenny, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, Julie Ross. Julie's been in, in uh, Alice Springs for 30 years. She's a local businesswoman. She's the Northern Territory President of the Chamber of Commerce. She's the first regional President of the Chamber of Commerce and the first female to hold that position as well. Uh, Julie, welcome. Thank you, Charlie. It gives me a lot of pleasure to be here tonight. As Charlie said, I've lived here for 30 years and been in business for most of that time. Most of you probably know my business is Ross Engineering and Fluid Power. Um, the business originated back in 1947, so we're, uh, we certainly have been here a long time. Employed a lot of local people over those years and also a lot of Aboriginal uh, people trying to get in um, to do apprenticeships and trade work. Um, as President of the Chamber of Commerce, my concern is that the violence in this town um, is giving us a very bad reputation. It is affecting us economically. It is driving tourists away. It is driving, well, I shouldn't say driving, but it, it is a, a factor when people decide to move on from here. And if businesses have invested a lot of time and other resources into training people, they have to start all over again. And we would like to see more jobs for Aboriginal kids. And that's one of the things I'd like to see as an outcome come from tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Kenny Linkleitner is uh, highly regarded and known throughout the Northern Territory. Of course, he's a, a local-born Alice Springs man. He's the president of uh, Australia's First Nations uh, political party. You might have seen him in the lead-up to, uh, to the election. Uh, but it's uh, great to have you here, Kenny. Thanks so much for uh, attending tonight. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> Look, I used this opportunity to actually um, uh, apologise on behalf of William Tillmouth because he's not well today, so that's why I stepped into his place. But also I used this opportunity to acknowledge the Mandarinya people and the Aussies that are here today. You know, we do have a dual heritage and dual responsibility towards shaping the future, and it starts this evening. So let's do it. Thank you, Ken. And the first of our... Uh uh, international panellists, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Lord John Allardyce. He's a member of the House of Lords in London. He's the chairman of the Liberal Democrats and he has a world view and experience across violence right around the world. How wonderful to have him in Alice Springs and to be on our panel. Welcome. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Charlie. And if I could start by paying my respects to the elders and people here now and, and in previous generations who are the custodians of this wonderful country right at the heart of Australia. It's a great pleasure and honour to be with you and also with other political leaders from the area, uh, public officials, people in business and health life and of course uh, with my colleague uh, Stuart Twemlow from the United States. Well why have uh, my wife and I come this distance from Ireland? Of course part of it is to see the wonderful country and part of it was actually to make contact with the Aboriginal side of my family with Erin uh, Patterson and, and Patricia who are here. But another part of it was because I was growing up in Northern Ireland when it was breaking down into violence. A bunch of people there felt bad about what was happening and, and violence broke out. And once it broke out, it was very, very difficult to deal with. And it wasn't the first time. It had happened many, many times over hundreds of years. And so I went into medicine and into psychiatry and eventually into politics to try to find ways of understanding why groups of people, not just individuals, but groups of people get involved in violence. We had a long peace process, as some of you will know. I was very much involved with, as a leader of one of the parties and then as a speaker of the parliament after the agreement. And I've spent much of my life since then 
going to other parts of the world which had been troubled by violence between groups of people. And I was delighted to be invited by friends in Cassie and the Congress to come here, not to tell people here what to do, of course, but to bring stories, uh, stories of other people in other places that may at least give you more hope and the kind of enthusiasm we all need to deal with such tough, difficult problems. So thanks very much for your welcome, Charlie. Thank you. And uh, Lord John, with uh, all due respects, uh, with Alice Springs, we'll drop the Lord from this point on and we'll just call you John if that's fine. Terrific. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Congress is a community controlled, comprehensive primary health care service, and their CEO is Donna Archie. Donna's uh, been in that position for the last 12 months, but she spent 10 years uh, working at uh, Congress, and she's one of those great Indigenous uh, women from the Northern Territory. Uh, you, you can welcome uh, your CEO here, uh, Donna Archie. Thank you, Charlie, and I'd also like to um, pay my respects and acknowledge the uh, Central Islander people and thank Aunty Barb for that warm welcome. Um, just a point of clarification, I'm a Bundjalung woman from the far north coast of New South Wales. Even though I have been um, living in Alice Springs for the last 25 years, uh, married into a local uh, family and have raised my three children here. Um, as a employee of, uh, of Congress, as a primary health care service, we do see the impact of, um, of um, violence and uh, the, the ways in which this is played out in terms of, um, of, of high levels of, of alcohol consumption, the issues around um, um, family neglect and those sorts of, uh, of issues. So I think it's this gathering tonight, uh, along with a number of the other panel members, of course, is a really important uh, time to have this kind of, uh, of discussion and conversation. And I hope that all of us, in bringing this uh, various perspectives to this conversation tonight, will move uh, this agenda forward to really deal with the high levels of, um, of uh, domestic violence in our community. I think we, you know, one of the statistics that concerns me is that, is that we've got 24% of Aboriginal women in Alice Springs are more likely to be um, uh, a, a recipient of domestic violence compared to non-Aboriginal women. So mm. just picking up on the point that Jenny made, I think there is a real issue about uh, violence against Aboriginal women, but having said that, I think it's an issue of that it's a whole community. So picking up on what Kenny has just said, this is for all of us to actually address, and I hope that we can have some kind of dialogue tonight that talks about real um, actions that are going to address that. So thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, our second international panel member is Professor Stuart Twemlow. He's the Professor of Psychiatry at uh, Baylor College in Houston, Texas. He's the Director of Healthy Community Initiative, uh, which is an initiative uh, between Miami and San Juan uh, in uh, Puerto Rico. And how wonderful to have him here. Professor, good to have you here. <clears throat> well, I would say, say to you all, Hiramara, Hiramara, Fatuhiri, Tuarangi. Welcome from New Zealand, where I come. Spent the first 30 years of my life. And my mother was Maori. The last full blooded Maori in New Zealand died in 1972. The history of the Maori is not dissimilar, except they fought a war that beat the British, although the British don't actually acknowledge that. <laughs> then, for some godforsaken reason, I moved to the United States against the wishes of all my friends who thought I was exposing my children to danger, which I was. And I've lived there 40 years, and in that 40 years, I've worked largely with schools, school violence, bullying, and all the sorts of things that destroy the climate of a school for children. I have lots of stories, and I want to share them, as John said. And I want to uh, feel like I want to make suggestions, but I'm going to be extremely humble and careful about whatever suggestions I make. And uh, the other thing I, that 
occurs to me as I stayed here was that this is a place I could really quite easily live. It's one of the most beautiful scenic towns that I've seen anywhere in the world, outside of New Zealand, of course. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Professor, and uh, panel, thank you so much. Uh, now we have the two uh, mic carriers, uh, Antoinette, uh, put your hand up, Antoinette, where are you? There's in the blue shirt over there, so Antoinette will work that side of the room. Uh, if you want to uh, go ask a question, you can just signal to Antoinette or stand at the bottom of the stairs, and Liam, just step over here, Liam, so they can see you. There's Liam, uh, he'll work this side of the room, and uh, if you guys in the middle will pass it in there. <coughs> Somehow we'll get it to you. But uh, just remember, no, there are no silly suggestions tonight and there are no bad ideas tonight. Whatever you want to say, you say it. It'll be, uh, it'll be good for us uh, to talk about tonight. Uh, I was looking at some stats when I, uh, just before I got on the plane today and uh, Alice Springs has a problem of its own. But around Australia, half a million, half a million women are uh, sexually abused or physically abused every year. And the figure just keeps growing. That, ladies and gentlemen, works out to about one every minute. So if we're here for three hours tonight, that's about 180 women that will have been sexually abused or physically abused in Australia. It's an appalling statistic that somehow doesn't get traction. For some reason, it just doesn't get out there. And now tonight's a good opportunity for us to talk more about it. Anyway, so the first uh, question here I'm going to put to the panel, uh, and if any panel member can answer it, uh, panel members can add on to it if they wish to, and you too, ladies and gentlemen, if you want. So the first question that's been prepared for me, the statistics panel tell us that Alice Springs is one of the biggest problems in the world when it comes to domestic violence. This is primarily a problem for Aboriginal women who are 24 times more likely to be assaulted than non-Aboriginal women, and the rate of assault in Alice Springs is about twice the Northern Territory average. What action do you think needs to be taken to address this appalling situation? It's a big question, uh, but I'll ask the panel if there's someone who would like to comment on that to get, to, to get the panel underway. Okay. So this uh, leaves me in that tricky position where I start uh, <laughs> picking on someone to do it. But Donna's going to do it. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Charlie. Um, look, I, I am aware that this is, and I'm conscious and cognizant of the fact that there are multiple causes um, to this issue, and it's you know a complex um, uh, area of of what makes this situation what it is. But if we look at including the issues around um, low socioeconomic status, the issues of employment, um, education, overcrowding. Um, are just one of the many um, areas that need to be addressed. But having said that, I think in many ways, one of the key causes, I think, um, relates to the issue of, of alcohol. So if we look at the uh, statistics around um, domestic violence, we know that there's about 70% uh, of the uh, territory-wide and, and in Alice Springs up to 90% of DV, of domestic violence, actually involves alcohol. Um, now, having said that, what can we do about alcohol as a key determinant of domestic violence? And um, Congress has been advocating for some time around some key uh, evidence-based um, uh, strategies, of which one includes the implementation of a floor price at, um, at the price of beer. Uh, also looking at the introduction of a no takeaway alcohol day linked to Centrelink payments, but also um, the need to reintroduce the photo licensing system that was um, abandoned uh, uh, 12 months ago uh, by the current CLP uh, government. And I think what we've seen is that um, we've got an example of effective um, action to reduce consumption through some of these strategies, particularly around the floor price. There is a, an element of a floor price um, in Alice Springs at the moment around 80 cents per standard drink. And so what we've seen with some of those um, supply reduction strategies is a, is, um, a, a, um, a reduction of about 18% in consumption which is then uh, correlated 
into a reduction of 100 and around 120 less hospital admissions uh, per, women, uh, per year for Aboriginal women in uh, Alice Springs Hospital. Um, more recently, we've seen that there was um, a recent crime statistics for the last 12 months that um, for up to June 30 uh, of this year has actually shown that DV has increased on average across the Northern Territory. Um, we look at, at territory at, at about 9%. The um, uh, Tennant Creek is around increasing at around 25%. And for um, Alice Springs, it's uh, at around 14%. Now, you know, if you combine these statistics with, um, with hospital data and unconfirmed alcohol sales data, and I'll talk more later on about the need to ensure that we've got um, uh, published data so we can make informed decisions about, about what is going on in our community, um, then we can see that there's a trend here that's going up and we've got to um, really deal with uh, strengthening these um, um, uh, alcohol restrictions and um, yeah so that that's one part of the the equation I think that we need to uh, seriously consider. Thanks uh, thanks Donna. So ponder that ladies and gentlemen so if we stop stop the grog does the violence stop? You may like to think about that. Uh, um, uh, Stuart, you, you uh, wanted to comment yeah, and then I Kenny wanted to comment as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with, with the way alcohol, uh, so to speak, damage, uh, what does people say, drowns your conscience. Throughout the world, that's what alcohol does. It helps you escape from the restrictions of your own conscience. However, I, I've got to point out that I think in Western Australia there are a couple of dry Aboriginal areas where the domestic violence rate is even higher than here, or as high. And I, I simply want to point out that alcohol, while important, is not the only cause of domestic violence. And I'm going to uh, jump in here with something that probably I shouldn't I mean, I haven't known a uh, community long enough. But one of the things I've noticed is that the concept of what a man is in the Aboriginal community and in the white community in relation to women is not very clear at all. For example, is a man a person who shows their strength by fighting? The history of the human race is that men really were not hunters and protectors. They were out managing their tribe from tribes at a distance, and the women were the hunters and protectors. What has happened that makes a man need to injure a woman in, in great detail? What's behind the concept of being a male, and what is the relationship between being a male in the Aboriginal uh, way and this remarkable uh, account here of the 2008 men's <coughs> summit where you see there's a sort of apology for being cruel. And so what I would suggest is getting people together to describe and discuss what they see their roles are as men and women and not limited just to Aboriginal. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Ken? Ken, you wanted yeah. to... Uh, thanks, Charlie. Look, a bit of a humour. Look, I was um, at Santa Teresa this morning and speaking to her auntie, and she said, Lord, look, um, your daughter was harassing me for money, and I thought she was asking for chutney. Chutney, but in fact, she was asking, well, I want to get chardonnay. So we've got to get the words right. So chardonnay or chutney. So she honestly thought it was for the food product, not the actual alcohol. So what we have to do here is actually um, teach or tell the story of the origins of alcohol, where does it actually come from? What is the story behind it if we are people of culture? We've got to know from which culture it comes from and what is the story and what God created it and what laws were given by that God. Then we're able to do a cross comparing and contrasting of culture and then we have a fantastic understanding of what, where this product comes from or appreciation. So we've got to look outside the box any other comments yeah, from the look, panel on that, that yes, uh, issue, Damien? Um, I understand 
uh, we were discussing alcohol, but I wonder how many people turn to alcohol because other parts of their life aren't that good. I mean, we had a commitment from the previous government who spent a lot of money in town in addressing accommodation, but it only brought us up to one point. There's no future plan, and I, I still see how much overcrowding is here, and that is an issue that needs to be addressed at a federal level, mm -hmm. how we provide people with accommodation, with somewhere to live, and, and I wonder how many people get lost inside a bottle because they don't have those basic needs, and that is housing. I mean, we see the number of people who are homeless. Yeah. Mm. I think fi the finding the starting point is the, the interesting thing here because um, Donna makes a fair point though with, with the alcohol but I mean it's difficult to work with someone to, to encourage them to stop the violence if alcohol is what drives them ev every day so I mean if you can stop the alcohol then you've got much more chance of actually working with them. I'm sorry who, someone else had there. Yep thanks. So, thanks John. Charlie. Uh, one of the things that has struck me just in the day or two since I've been here is what an enormous amount of work is going on on these kinds of issues. A lot of people working very, very hard. And I think it's important to signal up um, that they deserve praise and encouragement for this very difficult work. I used to work in alcohol addiction problems before I got heavily involved in the political side. And these are, these are problems which you don't resolve and can walk away from. They, they, they tend to relapse and they tend to come back from time to time. However, one of the things I did learn about the question of violence, not just with individual people, but with whole communities of people where violence is a problem, is that you need to go and talk to the people who are involved in doing the violence. Now, in my part of the world, that meant going and talking to people who ran organizations that were out trying to kill people because, because of their political motivations. And when I went to the Middle East, uh, I started off going and talking to some of the people that were involved in serious political violence. And it's a, it's a tough thing because it's not very politically popular. It's, it's easier to criticize those who are doing violence than engage with them. But if it's the case that men are doing horrible violence to women, and they are, I mean, there's just no doubt about it. There are other parts of the world where there's a lot of alcohol, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of difficulty with economic circumstances. But the, the level of violence against women is, is, is not like the level it is here. So I think there's a need to engage with men, with older men, with younger men, and to try to draw out some of the things. And, they, and they'll come with lots of different things, I'm sure. But I, I just get the sense that engaging with them may be a really important, really difficult thing. Uh, certainly, I've, I've found that in every part of the world that I've gone to, that it's been very tough to engage with people who are involved in violence. But if you don't do that, you don't really understand what's going on inside their heads, not just as individuals, but as a whole community of people. And I know there are folk here who are trying to do that, and I just want to commend them for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thanks, John. I, I encourage the audience, if you want to ask a question, put your hands up, and we'll get the, we'll get the microphones up there. Antoinette, if you, I think there's some questions over there that we can, we can take. Um, and panel, I'm, I'm going to come back to you, because the question was in this, in this first question was, what action do you think needs to be taken? I mean, is there something, do you think, is there a starting point for us? I mean, maybe this is it, maybe more of these things. Maybe from this day on, what's the one thing that maybe we should do? Uh, can we ask you to think about that as we go? I think, uh, where's the first question? I uh, might ask you to identify yourself and ask you to keep the questions uh, short if you Hello. could. Thanks, Tracker. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, look, I think we're murdering the victim. You know, you drink because you escape. And what, we, what the real debate should be about is the, the decentralisation of services, the economic paradigm that exists you know, within remote communities, the service or lack of thereof in remote communities, the movement of those people into town because there's no services, there's no jobs, there's no development. And we end up saying, well, why do you walk around drunk? Well, the reason I walk around drunk is because I don't come from this country, I come from somewhere else. I'm walking around here, I don't know how to behave in this country. Some people, other people own this country, I don't own this country. And we get this argument, well, why do you drink? Well, the drink, well, 
What else is there to do? You know, we, we uh, reap what we sow. If you put up bright lights, you're going to get moths. Simple as that. And if you don't like bright lights, you don't attract the moths because the Australian, sorry, the Central Australian economy is based on Aboriginal services. It's not based on tourism. It's not based on mining. It's not based on anything else. It's based on Aboriginal services. Until there's a connect, at the moment there's a great disconnect between the recipients of those services, the economics of it, and where the Aboriginal community stands on any given day in relation to services, jobs, employment, education and so forth. And at the moment we've seen governments after government time and time again spend a lot of money on, on programs that really don't add up. They don't go nowhere, no matter what size houses you built, you know, Port Keats built 100 houses, there's still 800 people looking for work. Right? So you, you've got this, this argument about where do you fit within society and someone from out bush turns up and says, well I don't know where I fit, I know that these people are looking after me when I go to jail, it's going to cost 100 grand to get me in and out of jail by lawyers, by police, by everything else, that's a cost to the community. So I must be worth a fortune as an Aboriginal person. So when you come to it, I hate to be rude, but this is the biggest social experiment we've seen for a long time, and I call it the nigger farm. Uh, because that's what we've got. Yeah. We've got a process where people are saying, right, oh, your dispossession is worth X amount of dollars to me. And that's where this argument's got to start. Not the victim, but coming back a step and saying, where does the decentralisation of resources, service and everything else that has built this town, where does that fit within the landscape in relation to some of the larger communities? And in a word, would, would, that, stop, would that stop the violence against women? If, if that well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to the victims, Charlie. I'm, I, I ignore the victims because the jail's full of victims, both from an Aboriginal perspective, both from the person who's victimised, both by the perpetrator of the crime. It does no one to, good to go to jail. I know I was part of the first, you saw me in Essendon House, Charlie, when I was a... Well, I was sent to school in a paddy wagon. And so, you know, so, you know let's, let's not go there. OK. All right, thanks, Track. Thanks very much. So, is there another question? I think back, or a, a, a statement. I'll just in, in, encourage you, please, to keep them short, if you wouldn't mind. Thank yeah, you. Sorry. No, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to, to put to the panel... A lot and introduce yourself, uh, please, Sorry, sir, my, name's you Phil, my name's Phil Walcott. I'd like to know from the, the panel, um, a lot of the language that we've been using tonight is all about violence. We all know what that looks like. What does domestic harmony look like? What does social harmony, if that's what we want, that's what we need to talk about. We've got to be very, very careful of the language that we use around this. It's the same as the victim status. If people are still breathing, they're survivors. Let's really look very closely at the language we choose to use and use it in a really positive sense to get that energy out there. Thank you. Panel, got a response on, on that? Thank you. OK. That's what my job is in Miami and San Juan. And you've raised, I think, a really critical issue. First of all, we can easily get bogged down on negativity. And I, I'm all in favour of looking at negativity. But I think uh, harmony needs to be a, a critical part of it. And connected with harmony is altruism, the doing good for others. I'm not preaching it as a spiritual thing, but simply as a practical way of keeping yourself healthy. Not only will your mind be healthier if you're altruistic, so will your body. Your blood coagulation improves, your immune system uh, responds better, and you're actually likely to live longer. So what, what are we doing in Miami? We're, living, we're doing our work in Little Havana has the highest homicide rate in the whole of the United States. And we're doing it in San Juan, which is another very violent city in Puerto Rico. And what we're doing is taking neighborhoods, neighborhoods are self-defined, and creating within that neighborhood a group of people who we call natural leaders. These are people who do things without having to be asked, who aren't appointed or receive any reward for what they do, they simply do it for the good of the community. They do it because it's their home. They do it because they feel connected to it. It's their neighborhood. Now, wh what is a neighborhood or a community of that sort? It's a place where you can do 
what you want to do to be happy. And of course you want it harmonious. I think it's a great way to think. So how do you get it harmonious? What we've done is create a system whereby law and order, health, education, and spirituality in the altruistic sense, representatives from the community, not official, just people who have a twist in that direction, collect together on a regular basis and talk about how their community <coughs> is functioning and receive from the rest of the work information about how other communities are functioning. In addition, these healthy community initiatives set goals for their own neighborhood. So what happens, we found over time, is not only does the homicide rate go down, and this might interest you, there's a, a, a measure we call immigrant degradation, which means that if you are new to the community, how much, to what degree do you not get a job because of your immigrant status or because of your race or because of your socioeconomic status? Immigrant degradation and homicide go way down. Graffiti disappears. And the other interesting thing is natural leaders start to police the neighborhood themselves. So if there's a bunch of kids who should be in school and they're playing in the park, instead of calling the police, the neighborhoods collect the kids and take them to school. Now this is a marathon, not a sprint. This doesn't happen overnight. This particular project is going for five years. These neighborhood collectives represent people who want to live in a neighborhood and do their own thing in their own idiosyncratic way without having to be constantly harassed with the horrifying statistics that we're, now, we're talking about tonight. And I think it can be done. And if any of you people here want to see what we're doing, I'd be very happy to let you know. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can you, uh, Kenny wanted to say something, and then we've got a question here, Kenny, to you. Thanks, Charlie. Look, uh, Phil, thank you. Fantastic question. The thing is, uh, harmony in my mind of thinking is it begins with actually two laws working together, not against each other, working together because each law and its construct comes from the heart and the mind. So if we bring those two together, we can have that harmony because people will be happy to live under certain laws that they create. Now, um, this is where the opportunity of actually writing good law is there. It's for the takings. So have members in there that could actually write laws that could remedy our social woes. That's what we need to do. Write good laws. Thanks, Kenny. Um, uh, sorry, Charlie. I'd just like to go back to the, the harmony and the education within neighbourhoods. I mean, I think sometimes it gets missed, some of the good work that's being done in our community. If you look at the girls at the centre, or the Centralian Girls Academy, or the Clontarf programs, they are all doing very well, and they've got a lot of young leaders already in there who are doing <coughs> good work. Very widely in our community, we brush over the top of those at times. I'm very lucky in my job. I mean, there's young lasses, you know, there's Sissy Dunn, or there's, there's Jessica White. I mean, there's Jessica um, McAdam I come across. Uh, there are young people in the community who are working very hard. So in the discussion that from the other end of the table where we talked about a sprint or a marathon, yes, we are in a marathon, but we've got to keep encouraging those young leaders in our community to keep doing the work that they're doing. Mm. I want to come back to the education thing in, uh, in, in just a moment, um, but we'll take that question, I think, from up behind that light there somewhere. Was it a lady? Yeah. Hi, Julie Vincent. Um, I just wanted to address that query that you raised at the beginning. I guess what what the issue is is to address um, alcoholism and violence, which are symptoms, and the children suffer as well, is empowerment of the men. It's empowerment. It's to give the men a sense of their own, as you've tapped on, um, well. accomplishment and um, value and identity in, in their own culture. And um, to, to, I think there needs to be a shift so, such that there is a valuing of uh, who Aboriginal people are. Mm -hmm. And that's different for each people group. Mm. It's, it's, these are all symptoms we need to get to the root, mm -hmm. and that is to empower people. Thank you. Good question. Charlie, may I, Charlie, may I just respond, on, given that I've sort of um, started the debate around, to some extent, 
about symptom and cause and um, the issues around, and not that I disagree with any of the points that have me been made so far. I think the issue of alcohol, though, and when we take up the point and respond um, to, to Stuart around the marathon and that, that things don't happen overnight, some of those things that um, have been talked about in the light of, of alcohol being a symptom is that those things won't happen overnight and they are things that people have been advocating for some time mm -hmm. to have addressed, like education, like housing in terms of overcrowding, uh, dealing with the issue of high unemployment rates, uh, dealing with the issue of inequality and um, economic uh, development and the redistribution of, of wealth to ensure that we get uh, that sort of inequality uh, addressed. Mm -hmm. But my response to that as well is not to say that that isn't what's needed, but we need to recognise that if we're going to look at uh, a, an issue of quantum effect, what is it that we can do now that can particularly make some inroads tomorrow, within a week, around um, the issue of DV. And I think that alcohol, if we do deal with reducing the consumption, we will see a, a correlating um, a response to the level of, of um, harm, and particularly in DV. We, we, we know that the Fitzroy um, uh, Valley uh, a study that was done where the women really advocated for alcohol restrictions. And as a result of those restrictions, what we actually, what the evidence shows is that there was a 70% reduction in consumption that re related in, in a halving of the domestic violence. Mm. So there is a, a correlation. I'm not saying that, that we don't do all those other things, but what, what do we do that we know that we can make a difference relatively quickly while we continue to make sure that we get those other issues dealt with. Terrific. Thanks, Donna. Now, look, panel, I just want to go back to that. So what's the, and, and Donna touching a bit on it there. So what's the next thing? What's one thing that we can walk out of this room from uh, tonight and say it's a good thing for us to do? Yeah, I just want to ask the panel. We'll go across the panel there. What's the next thing that you think we can, we can actually do? Is it more of these sorts of meetings? Is it, is it more research? I mean, what is it? Damien, what's... Well, what, think, and don't, just short answers. Yeah, just, I think when you have meetings... You look at the room. We don't. We need different people in the room as well. We need a, a broader group. We're talking about other people, and we we need to break out into smaller groups and carry that story further afield. Okay, Jenny. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I do agree with Donna that reduction of supply of alcohol seems to be the thing that has the um, biggest impact for the uh, less cost. Uh, however, how that's done is not something I can really talk about. It's really become, a, you know, very political now. But I think everybody has to encourage what measures um, might reduce supply to problem drinkers and those that might offend in this way. Uh, but I do want to mention that uh, we have uh, obviously a criminal law response for people that are already uh, offending in this way, uh, but there's probably not enough happening in terms of teaching people about respectful relationships. Uh, the Love Bites program, for instance, that is run primarily by a, a Swiss um, charitable organisation in a number of schools in the Northern Territory, teaches young people uh, respectful relationships. They know, uh, they can learn, for instance, when things are uh, starting to mean that somebody's uh, controlling you. Um, a lot of the issues that are being talked around uh, around social uh, problems, and I totally understand that that is very difficult, but it does not explain the gendered nature of the violence that we're talking about. Why is it that it's 80, 90 per cent perpetrated by men. So it explains some of it. It doesn't explain the gendered nature of the violence. So I think for young people, we have to have uh, preventative programs, educational programs about what does a respectful relationship look like. Thanks, Jenny. I'm on, and I was going to get to that uh, as well, to talk about education. <laughs> Julie, what's the next thing we should do, you think? Thank you, Charlie. I actually agree with... Um, 
with both the other two speakers. Um, I believe we should have more um, con consultation like this, but it should be with targeted groups, whether it's with the kids or with problem drinkers or uh, with, with families together. And I, and I do believe respect plays a huge part in this. Terrific. Thank you for that. Kenny? Thanks. Julie, thank you very much for your question. Look, I'd like to look at this from the uh, traditional perspective, past, present and sort of future, is that we as a society didn't survive for 60,000 years beating up on our wives or our mothers, right? Because it takes females to have children. So females were a gift as a sort of, um, you had to earn the rights to be able to marry as well, because with that process, there was absolute respect and honor of actually being given a wife. To then moving into the sort of kind of present, well, we've lost that because we're not empowered. Empowered in a way that we have to think with the traditional construct of where did we come from, how did we get here, and what do we do now? What construct of law can we take forward with us? And the future, well, it's open. We're, we're getting into the area we can write laws as well. We can reinvent ourselves. So that's where I want to be, is re, we reinventing ourselves. Thank you, Kenny. That's great. Thank you so much. John, what's next? What's the one thing we can do? I have, as a politician, always had an unfortunate tendency to try to answer the question that I'm asked, which is not very common amongst my colleagues. So I'm not going to say that you know, there's, there's lots of different issues. I'll try to answer the one thing, which is what you asked. Yep. It's my perception that in the Aboriginal community over tens of thousands of years, the men who were older and had experience and had seen life in all its different aspects had something very special to contribute to the next generation of men and indeed of the community as a whole. But the degree of change that there has been in the last 30, 40, 50 years is greater than there was over the previous 65,000 years. And suddenly, the people who knew the most and had the most experience and the responsibility for guidance find themselves wondering, what on earth is this world that I'm in? When my father-in-law, Joan's dad, retired early as a bank manager, I said, why did you do that? You could go on a few more years. He said, John, I'll tell you why. Today it's Friday, and I know more about what's going on in this bank than any of the other employees, because I'm the manager. But over the weekend, we're going computerized. And on Monday morning, I will know less about banking than anybody else in this bank. And I'm not going to hang around and do it. And he went on and did other things. But of course, the elders in the community here can't go on and do other things. And then there's a problem about how the next generation look to them or find difficulties with that. And I think there's a real problem in there. And I think men in the community have an incredible challenge to find a way through all of this. And therefore, the one thing it seems to me, and there are many, there's the alcohol issue, there's, there's women's services, there's a whole bunch of things, but the one thing it seems to me is there needs to be a focus on how to address this question of how men, older men and younger men, adapt to a situation that's changing so fast, none of us can keep up with it, never mind those who are having to move from a traditional position to leadership in a new and very frightening world. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Donna, you made the point about alcohol. Do you want to add more to that, or is that the next thing we should look at, do you think? Um, well, there is one particular area. I think if we look at empowerment and we look at the control, <coughs> pardon me, the control factor, um, I think that the evidence shows that, that education is a key determinant of that. Now, if we're going to see improvements in not just the participation uh, rates of uh, Aboriginal people um, in the education system, but actual um, good outcomes, educational outcomes, uh, our view is, is that we need to start early and we need to ensure that we prepare our kids so that they have a positive experience in the school system and that we're, we're preparing them for that. Now, there are a number of um, uh, evidence-based programs that can uh, respond to that challenge 
and the, they include the home visitation program, which is working with uh, parents, mainly mothers, up until the child is, is age two. And it's been uh, evaluated uh, uh, across a number of countries, of which and we're, we're delivering it here in, in, at Congress. And what it's done is shown that, that it actually increases the uh, prenatal um, women's health. We see a reduction in arrests and, and um, jail and convictions. We see a fewer subsequent pregnancies. Um, and greater intervals between those births. We also see father improvement, so if we're talk talking about male um, um, involvement in the family. We've also, it also showed that there was an increase in employment and a decrease in welfare dependency, an issue that has been debated for an, a number of years now. We've also, it showed that there's been an improvement in school outcomes. So for me, I'd like to see this program being uh, uh, run not just in Alice Springs but throughout Central Australia and, and for that matter across the Northern Territory and, and the rest of the country. Just target, target successful programs. And, There's only a number so. of sites in um, Australia that this is being uh, delivered. But there's another program that can also assist with this if we're going to look at uh, primary prevention uh, uh, strategies to deal with not just domestic violence but a whole range of um, issues around addictions <coughs> Uh, whether it's drugs, alcohol, um, even addictions to, we've got issues around obesity. And I know I'm getting off the track here, but this is, these programs are going to deal with a, a, a range of, um, of, of issues. And that actual program is what's called the Absidarian um, Early Learning Educational Daycare Centre. And what it requires is, is having a child in this centre for a minimum of 28 hours per week. It has the children exposed to three key components, which is um, learning games, enriched caregiving, and also conversational reading. And this program has shown to make a big difference in um, the healthy development of the child, so that especially around um, voca vocabulary and language skills, which is what is actually needed when we're preparing our schools for the education preparing our kids for the education system. So I think that these are evidence-based programs that we should be getting behind and, and, and uh, implementing. Okay. Stuart, did you want to make yeah, a comment? Yeah, I'll try and be What's brief, the next thing to but do? I, I've got one, one odd thing to suggest and, and, and just a repetition of what I said in the first place, which is that uh, along with John Alderdice, I believe that the relationship between men and women and children needs to be redefined. I like your idea of reinvented. There's a loss of power of men. This is not only in the Australian Aborigine, it's also in the American male. The women's liberation has changed the way men see themselves and the world they live in. So now one old man said to me, I feel great about it, I can write poetry and not be called gay. And you know, I get the feeling that this world is out of hand with the young people and you along with all of us, we're stuck in roles that need to be redefined. And so I would simply very strongly suggest that if possible, get young people, women and children together. I don't know if that would be possible to define what is respectful in the marital role. You have the formula laid out there. I think the need to do that is obvious. <coughs> And I think it'll make a huge amount of difference. And here's the silly thing. There's a hormone produced during lactation in women called oxytocin. And we've done some work with it. And what it does in men, you, can, you sniff it up your nostrils. It makes them more empathic, it makes them softer, and far less violent and impulsive. So I'm suggesting, you, I'm honestly suggesting you look into sniffing oxytocin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, we, look, we've got a number of questions from the, the, the floor we'll take. Just before we go, I mean, the, the worry is if we don't do something about this problem, all we do is we keep passing it on to the next That's generation. Right. So for men, it's always the okay thing to do, um, and it's not the okay thing to do. And it's a good chance for us today to make a strong statement. So uh, there's so many hands up, I'm not sure. Of course, who's got, has someone got a microphone? Um, Antoinette, you good? 
Who's got the microphone? There we go. Thank you. Is it on? Um, my name's Beverly Angelus, and I actually work at Centralian Senior College with these wonderful young women that are the chaperones here tonight. So I work at the Centralian Girls Academy um, here at Centralian Senior College. But um, just reinforcing what most people are saying, you know, um, everyone has to have their place, whether it's in your, um, at your school, in your footy team, in your family, in your community. You know, um, knowing your place and having a place, it gives your life meaning and purpose. Um, and, you know, like with all, you know, what people are saying, with all the changes, you know, um, that our traditional people have had to um, face, yeah, poor things, you know, some of our, our um, males are just, they're in limbo. They don't, they don't know where their place is anymore. So, you know, and we, we talk about education and, and acquiring knowledge and skills and all that. Well, most of our old people have got that, and a young mob. It's about acknowledging the skills yeah. that they have too, and using that as a platform to find their place in, in this world that we live in today. Um, and, you know, that can be done in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, which I won't go into. But I just think, you know, that we have to understand that our men are trying to find their place in this modern world. But, you know, let's acknowledge what they bring too, because there's some very, very educated um, men out there. And that's about empowerment. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's take them from the floor there. Uh, try and keep them short if you can. We've got, uh, what have we got left? About 40 minutes, so we want to get as many comments as we can, please. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Francis Xavier. I'm the member for Arafura and uh, member of Legislative Assembly. Um, my question is, do you think employment and economic development are important for allowing us to live together in a better way? Alcohol and drugs are also a big problem in communities. Do you think Rehabilitation is the important ways of breaking the cycle of drug and alcohol dependency. Do you think cultural understanding is an important part of rehabilitation? Oh, there's a lot in that, well, isn't there? Yeah, the, I mean, the regional development is an issue, and, and go back to Tracker originally talking about everything being centralised instead of being in the remote regions of Australia. Um, I mean, I travel around some pretty broad areas across the Territory, and if there is nothing to do, like Beverly said before, people do wonder what, where their position is. But what is that work? I mean, we, we've had a concentration on uh, spending a lot of infrastructure money in this country on, on an NBN. Now, that's all very well for the east coast of Australia, but it doesn't really help us in remote Australia to the extent of how do we put infrastructure into remote regions so that people can learn trades, can, can work within industries, in communities. I fully support the fact that we need to have regional development money placed in, in what I would describe as remote regions. It's the only way people are going to be able to build their own uh, structure, their own strength within themselves. You've, you've got to be able to do that and that needs a really strong commitment from government to do that. Julie, yep. We've got, we'll come there in a sec, sorry. Thank you. Um, the Chamber has been lobbying the Northern Territory Government for quite a long time, previous government and this one, for further development in the growth towns because we have identified that um, if you put people in employment that um, you seem to break down those barriers when, when people are working side by side. And also it keeps, gives people a chance to go back to their own land, to go back to their own land and, and develop that. Unfortunately, the, uh, apparently there are some land issues around that. You can't ask people to set up businesses if they can't um, have tenure of land. But um, we are certainly uh, lobbying the government uh, for that development in growth towns. Terrific, thanks. Uh, we'll a quick comment. Let me tell you something. Back at home in Ireland, we had two communities, a Protestant Unionist one and a Catholic Nationalist one. 
And the Protestant Unionist one had the control of a great deal, including the big industries, shipbuilding, heavy engineering, powerful physical men-type jobs. And the Catholic community realized that not only could they not get the jobs, but if they wanted a future, they needed education. And so they, they focused on that. Of course, if you start education now with three, four, five-year-olds, it's a whole generation before you get the outcome. Yeah. But here's what happened. The Catholic community regarded education as the way out, and they grabbed it. And working class and middle class and unemployed and boys and girls all grabbed the hold of education. And 25 and 30 years later, where are the jobs? In heavy engineering? No. In shipbuilding, it's all gone. They're in things like computers, software, pharmaceuticals, things like that. And so what's happened is that now the Catholic community is able to get the jobs and the working class Protestants who didn't attend to education and who didn't grab hold of the opportunities, they're the ones that are now finding themselves without jobs and they're actually the ones who are doing the violence on the streets at the moment. So this issue of education is incredibly important and you're remote here. We're quite remote in Ireland. You're really remote. <laughs> but it doesn't matter how remote you are if you've got internet access. There's all sorts of jobs that you can do as long as you've got the education. So access to broadband and education to exploit it makes it possible for all ages and genders to make a living. Terrific. John, Kenny, I'll come to you in a, in a moment, but I'm just going to, I'll just take a couple from the audience. So, just if a I, quick one then. Oh, just take a couple from the, from the um, audience. Just a couple of things. Louise if that's not on, I don't think. Regarding, is that on now? <laughs> Regarding what you said about oxytocin and the question about why is there this gender difference between the um, men and women, one of the most important factors that has to be considered, first of all, is that violence isn't all about physical violence. And there's an awful lot of verbal violence, which is just as damaging. Yeah. There's the other thing I'd like to say is that when people are under stress, men and women produce oxytocin. The trouble is that in men, the oxytocin, the action of oxyto oxytocin is blocked by testosterone. So women under stress go into tend and befriend behavior, go shopping, bake a cake, call a girlfriend. Men under stress, the testosterone, they go into fight or flight behavior. Yeah. And you have to, that is a fundamental neurological thing that is occurring that has to be addressed if you are going to deal success, successfully with domestic violence. It doesn't, there's another dynamic that then comes into that, that when women go into tend and befriend behaviour and say, oh, you seem upset, dear, would you like a cup of tea? That then triggers off oxytocin in the bloke and overrides his testosterone. So you can get a very unhealthy dynamic built up where men see themselves, they see women as responsible for how they feel, and women see um, themselves as responsible for how they feel, which is disastrous in terms of domestic violence. Now, these are neurological things that we, now know, we know now. What is very important, though, is the traditional Aboriginal society had a whole host of checks and balances that actually worked with, they didn't realise it was oxytocin, but they did understand human nature, they understood human frailty, and they had a whole lot of traditional practices to deal with that. Hmm. If you want to deal with domestic violence, not just in this town, but all over Australia and all over the world, then you will look at some of the values and traditional practices in conjunction with this modern understanding of what has happened neurologically. There is also a great body of research that can help you with these issues, but you have to do it in a strategic approach. We've had some fantastic ideas here tonight, and they all slot in to a known strategic approach for dealing with these kinds of issues. And I would like to suggest that what is needed now is a committee or something to start to work more strategically on how you address each of these factors, whether they be prevention, or immediate factors like alcohol that could be addressed could reduce the problem. And so you have a holistic or aboriginally culturally appropriate approach to this issue. 
Okay, thank you so much. That's a great. Okay, uh, good. Um, while you're transferring good that, I'll get Kenny to. Yeah, I suppose um, we've got to realise too our cultures are all made up of words, and in regards to economics and whatever, you know, you've got to look at hunting and gathering. Now, this is what we've got to be able to define. Well, what is the purpose of hunting and gathering? It's about surviving. And what, what are the works that's associated with it? Providing for the family. And in this modern world, is we've got to be able to provide for the family through employment. We work for someone that gives us the money to be able to still go hunting and gathering in the supermarket. We've got to be able to make these words work. And it's all about culture. Culture of words that can, can become a, a brick wall or something that could allow us to see it. So thank you for that. So that connects to your uh, question or your point up there, Francis Xavier. I'm going to take a question in the middle and then come to you in a sec. Hello. Uh, John Little here. I'm the manager of Congress Men's Health. Um, we're the ones that we actually put these two summits together out the front there. Um, one of the things that, and I'm glad Kenny's just touched on it, is the role of the man, um, especially in communities. If we look at that walk in my shoes up there, if we walk in the shoes of some of the men who live in those communities and some of the guys at the front there actually met with some blokes at our service yesterday and they got told that men don't have a role in the communities anymore, only as the perpetrators mm. or the, uh, mm. the uh, potential perpetrators. So what we need to do is reinforce the role of men and Kenny's touched on the stuff where the role of the man who provides for the family and that means hunting at the moment, the man has to go and hunt for that kangaroo in the supermarket freezer. Yeah. So that's pretty demeaning. They've got to line up. They've got to get a kangaroo tail that's brought in from South Australia somewhere, which is totally out of shape to the ones we've got here. They yeah. taste different. They smell different. But we still have to eat them. Yeah. But um, one of the things I want to try and get back to, a few minutes ago you asked about what, uh, what can we do. And I want to try and get Bruce Looms over there. He's got his arms folded to bring that red sign near the door over there out and open a bit so most people can see that sign there. And that came out of one of these summits where that is one of the actions that all of us can do. We can use our big mouths. We've all got big mouths in this room. When we see something happening, we have to have the gonads to say something about it. We've got to have, and there's no other words for this, we've got to have the balls to say something about Violence. We can say stop. And this, <laughs> I've got to say, this actually happened to me and my missus sitting alongside of me. And I've got to say, we've been engaged for 32 years. We're not married yet. <laughs> but I believe, in, I, believe, <laughs> I believe in long engagement. We were at the football. And we were in the non-drinking area. And it's when Carlton came to town, when Carlton actually beat the uh, West Coast Eagles. But at the same time, two feet away from us, an Aboriginal bloke was kicking the shit out of his wife right alongside of us. I was the youngest man in the arena, in the little non-drinking area. And everyone looked around, we could hear this crunching of punches and the groans of the woman, but no one did anything about it. We all looked away and we expected someone else to do something. So we all have to grow those gonads and say something about it. That's a simple thing that all of us can do. And I've been saying to people, we might get a smack in the mouth because we interfere or intervene, but we all have to take the issue in hand. We can't disregard it. And I raised this issue last week in Melbourne and the people at the front there can nod or groan because I did, but it brought the house down. So we need to make sure that all of us here in this room here, we can all be disciples of that sort of activity. That's something we can do as soon as we walk out that door. Mm -hmm. We don't need money. We just need a bit of heart and the gonads to go with it. Thank you. Good point. I think uh, yeah, we're going up there. Thank you. Chris Hawke. Chris Hawke, I've worked for the last six years on a remote Aboriginal community of Santa Teresa, supporting issues around violence, suicide, depression, all those difficult issues. Um, we had an independent evaluator come to the community, and it's publicly available, this document, to talk with the social emotional wellbeing theme about what to do. And one of the Three key recommendation was localised decision makings. Men and women said, talk to us, give us some choices about what we do. Mm -hmm. And all the organisations that come to our communities, and there's lots go out there, 
Um, their decisions are made in Alice Springs, Darwin, Canberra and the funding. Almost no one is localising decision making. And you can look that up, it's done, Professor Tim Kerry with the Centre for Remote Health did it and you can get it on the website. And that's what the men are doing. For example, three men here in Alice Springs a couple of years ago, Matt from Carflu, the family legal unit, an Aboriginal fella, Jonathan who works with the education department and Charlie who works with mental health fellows out in the west. Three Aboriginal fellows got together and said, what should we do? They found another Aboriginal fella out on the east coast who runs a thing, Greg Telford, rekindling the spirit. They invited him over. They took three or four weeks to do it. They got the funding through car flu and it's just changed their lives. The most effective program I've ever seen. And I've seen lots of them working. And it's, that's because local men wanted to do it. They stood up and they found somebody and they did it. Mm -hmm. And all our structures need to be worked Yes, have committees at this level, and this is a white fellow way of working. But on remote communities especially, and with men especially, who find it really uncomfortable speaking up in gatherings like this, we need to find ways to localise decision making. That's really core. Cool. Thank you. Another. Hi, Charlie. There's plenty up there. We'll take one lady here, and then we'll see. Hi, up. Charlie. Um, my name's Donna McMasters. I'm a community member here tonight to just come along and, and listen to the views of, of the community and the member, many community members here tonight. I think what it's all about, and this is my own opinion, is about walking in my shoes in my culture, because it's, it's a hard, hard road, and we've come a long way over the years. My, my family was stolen and taken away because of the policies of the day. Social policies has interfered too much in our culture, and I talk about my culture, and it has disempowered us. So we need to rekindle that. We don't need to re de redefine it. We need to bring back that definition of what it means as far as our kinship go, because that's what drives us. Our kinship, our family, our caring for country. And if we can't do that together as a community, because we're not only walking in two, two cultures or two different communities, we're walking in one with many cultures. So we've got to learn all how to work together and talk together to, to make a difference. And again, it comes back to communication and how we communicate. And if we can't communicate properly to one another or to our community, well, it's pointless. So it's come back to how we use our language. Why should we be talking English when we've got so many traditional languages here? I work for an interpreter service. I manage the southern region. I'm a president of a local Aboriginal football club, which we can deal with at least more than 75 men on a given weekend. Our men have been disempowered. Our women have been disempowered. Our lives have been disempowered. But walk in my shoes and my culture and we'll learn from one another. And you've done it. We've got a microphone up, up there somewhere. Where are we? Is this one working? Is there... Hi, Antoinette, you've got to... Who's got it? There we go. Yep. Is that all right? Um, yeah. Charlie, yeah, David Ross, Central okay, Land David. Council. Um, look, I'd, just a point of order. Um, Julie raised some issues earlier on about, uh, about uh, access to, uh, to land in communities and things of that nature. Uh, Tracker <coughs> raised a number of issues earlier. Just a point of order there, Julie. Um, it's not access to land. If you want access to land, um, come to the Land Council, talk to people about... Uh, about getting a lease in Aboriginal land. The real issue, the real issue is underlying, is uh, most Aboriginal communities throughout the Northern Territory and certainly throughout Central Australia, the big problem is infrastructure. So you can build all the houses you like, you can't hook them up to water, power, sewerage, roads, etc. There's just none there. <coughs> We've uh, pretty much run out of uh, land that has uh, infrastructure. So just today I signed a letter of support to the Northern Territory Government to go to Infrastructure Australia for half a billion dollars to try and put some money into these communities. Now, I had no intention of talking here tonight, but I just thought it's important that I, I, uh, I bring this to your attention. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sit the microphone up. There's a see a lady there. Hi, it's Vicky. We got one My there, name. sorry. Yeah, sorry. My name's Vicky Gordon and I'm not from this country but I've lived and worked remote for many years as a nurse and I really just want to um, acknowledge all the other speakers but it's very difficult to pull out individual things when every, everything is connected to everything else and related to health essentially and there's no single 
kind of um, strategy. It's a multi-pronged approach. But I guess one of um, the lifestyle of people of change, and many people have alluded to it, is the element of change in people's lives and having some sort of meaningful occupation. But I have a particular thing about racism. And having lived out bush for many years, I found it very difficult when I first came to Alice Springs to live, to see it so open. And I think I'm involved in a program at the moment um, we are, where we are um, working on helping non-Indigenous people understand where Aboriginal people are coming from. So it involves um, culture, cultural safety and culture shock, but it also includes the determinants of health. And essentially, everybody works in health. It doesn't matter whether you work for one money mob or whatever. It's all related to health. And I think of Alex Brown's study where he, he looked at five different individual um, uh, groups of Indigenous men, and they were all because they, they all felt racism um, in a very big way. And I think we have to somehow... I think the programme involved in I'm trying. we're trying to promote it, so that people can learn more where people are coming from. The other thing is that I read a study of the, the number of men incarcerated in jail and their hearing loss. Near, uh, I think it was 90% of them had moderate hearing loss. 75% of them didn't know what was going on around them because of the hearing loss. And 66% experienced tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. So tinnitus could lead to drinking could lead to beating up your wife, leading to being in jail, and all these things go round and round and, and interconnected. But as my understanding with hearing services for the incarcerated men in jail is that it's really just not happening. The other thing is the interpreter service, because communication is a huge issue. It came out not very long ago that 70 or 75 per cent of the people who left hospital didn't know why they were there. That's an absolute travesty. The interpreter service has, um, I've been involved a little bit with them lately, in that helping with interpreters to get an idea, for instance, about understanding how the valves of the heart work so that they can interpret it. So I think in looking at um, kind of things that we could progress, the program I'm involved in to help people understand where Aboriginal people are coming from, the use of interpreters, at attending to people's hearing loss, um, I think, are, are some, you know, a small number of things that could be really uh, useful uh, in helping in helping some of the is these issues we face in the community. Thank, Thank you, you for listening. Thank you very much. I think we've uh, panel. Are you happy for me to take them for, take uh, comments from the floor? Yep, we're up the back there somewhere. I think. Hi, my name's Tanya Collins. I've worked um, in the criminal justice system in this country for. Since I was 19, I'm 39 years of age. I've worked with lots of Aboriginal men throughout Australia. I've had the privilege of working with lots of um, Aboriginal women as well. Um, what astounds me is that we have a captive audience in the sense of the huge incarceration rate of Aboriginal men and also the increasing incarceration rate of Aboriginal women in um, prisons in the Northern Territory. And there just are no programs readily available to most of the population. Um, most Aboriginal people I've met who have committed violence in many forms um, seek assistance and would like to learn better ways of interacting with their family members. Um, and they're just not given the opportunity to learn. And that's why we have such a huge recidivism rate in this, in this community, because I represent young fellas um, in the criminal justice system, and I have known many, many young men who have gone on to be in and out of the criminal justice system. And time and time again, I ask them as their lawyer, have you had an opportunity to get counselling? Have you had an opportunity to do something about your anger? Have you had an opportunity to do something about your grog problem? And they say no. And we're happy to lock people up, but we're not happy to give them the opportunity to learn and to change um, the, their situation. Thank you. Charlie. Where are we? Here. Great. <laughs> Great. Yeah, before, to, before, we move short, on, before we move on, quickly, I'd like the Mayor and the Head of the Chamber of Commerce to get all the businesses that supply Aboriginal services to meet and deal with this issue about employment, the delivery of the social dividend in terms of employment and training, because you're, you are preferred contractors or service providers 
to a lot of remote Aboriginal communities, and we'd like to see a return on our investment in through your businesses in terms of employment and training. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a lady. I'd just like to make a, like to make a comment back to that. Um, I support your ideas, but the town council doesn't supply services no, no, to those remote areas. Oh, okay. So I just thought I'd ask that. <laughs> okay, no problem. I think we got one up the back uh, next. Have we got a microphone up there? Yeah, I've got one. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Sarah. Um, I don't want to bring everything down here, but I don't know if people just noticed what happened on the weekend. <laughs> um, we've just had pretty well one of the most um, racist men elected to our government. We're looking at going backwards again. If we look at what Howard did to Aboriginal services, how he attacked Aboriginal um, culture, um, Aboriginals people's uh, self-determination and the very right to have self-determination, we're looking at going through another one of those periods. And that means unprecedented attacks on all sorts of services, particularly Aboriginal services. Um, as always, um, Aboriginal people are first to experience the worst of government policy, and I think you're going to be seeing that again. So I guess my <laughs> question for the panel and for everyone is how are you preparing for the attacks we're about to have? I don't think we can sit in a position, anyone here, and say that um, what we're going to be, that we're happy where we are now, but we're going to see things getting worse rather than better in terms of funding, um, in terms of attacks on the victim again, um, in terms of, um, you know, all the, what we saw with Howard and now we've got Abbott. So I'm really scared about the future um, and I want to know what other people are going to do about the attacks that we're going to be seeing. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, I, I mean, I, we should make the point, I think, that um, you know, the discussion is around the high levels of, uh, the, of family violence. Um, it doesn't matter uh, which government is in, in control. The, the, the level of family violence doesn't change. It just continues to grow and it's continued to grow over the years, it, it never stops. And we do need a community movement. We need community voices to convince government to do something about it. This is a good start for that. Is there someone else with a, with a question? Yep. There, the thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Tyson Carmody. Um, I work at a local school here with uh, young people who are disengaged from mainstream school. Um, and I just wanted to touch with the co comment back here about harmony. Um, living in harmony together, like, you know, we, we can't really live in harmony together if we don't know each other properly. And that comment just sort of got me thinking about what I want to do with the young people at school. Because um, they're not exposed to, to, our, to, our, to the different cultures that are living in Alice Springs now. Like the Sudanese, the, the different, there's, there's a wide range of people that are living in Alice Springs now and we want to celebrate that. Um, and our young people, don't know those people from a bar of soap, so they don't know them, so they don't understand them, and they're scared of it. And you know what you don't know, you're afraid of. That's that what that's what creates you know racism and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I want to expose more, my young people that I work with to those different people, and older people, younger people, business people, whoever you know, because they need to they need to sort of broaden their horizons of relationships. Um, and just on the topic of, you know, governments and stuff, you know, we at the, I was at the summit in Ross River and the common, or I, I felt the common sort of theme was, yes, time for action, but it's not just from government or just from whoever, it's from us on the ground. Get up and do it ourselves. Like, you know, so. um, well, I have a question for the panel in a moment, but we'll take a question down the front here. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, hello. Yeah, my name's Aaron. Uh, I live in Rockhampton, central Queensland, but as a 10-year-old boy back in 1974, I used to live in Alice Springs beside Anzac Hill, and I used to play in the Todd R River with a lot of uh, Anangu kids. But I just wanted to uh, share a story. Working for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service, I've made lots of friends and I work in uh, a remote community twice a month I go there, and uh, what I've found, many of those men who are in jail now for committing uh, offences of domestic violence and serious assault on their partners, 
which is also domestic violence. One thing I found is when they're in jail, I often hear that they say, oh, I've got to ring up my missus. And, I, and a couple of the men I've spoken to, I said, why would you want to ring your missus up if you're in jail for bashing her? And, you know, just straight out, because that's the type of person I am. And they said, yeah, I know, brother, if I give up the grog, uh, you know, I don't, don't want to keep coming back to jail. I'm getting old now. I'm 39, I'm 49, whatever I am. And even the young men I talk to, too. But the one thing I find is that these men who commit uh, domestic violence against their women don't have the support of other men. So what I, what I just, the point I want to make is uh, what the gentleman at the front and the panel have said tonight is one of the things I think should be very, very strongly uh, supported and endorsed is uh, give some of the power back to the men to uh, make men help men be good men. That's yeah. all. We've heard the comment often tonight about empowering men. It's come up quite a bit throughout the night. Panel, can I, we'll come back to you for, uh, um, we've got uh, about 12 minutes to go before we wrap it up and uh, some wonderful stuff coming from the floor, we realise. But um, we talked about education. Um, is, 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 the edu is education the one thing for our young kids that can actually teach them to deal with this issue of the, of the violence so that they don't follow in the, in the, in the, the, the footsteps of their, their fathers and their uncles and so on. Can, can, the edu can education tackle that problem? Is that where it should be? Well, education, uh, we hear it all the time, but I mean, I think it's also, uh, it's not just education in the three R's. I think it's education in respect. It, it's education in the family structure. And we spoke before about how uh, it seems like some men have, missed, have lost their position within family. I think that's a really important area. We do have lots of breakout groups that, that help youth, but I think we've got to involve the family more within that educational system as well. So mm. is that we can get a structure back together. No different to, I mean, you know, I say I'm the lucky one. I had a, a, I had a father who, who helped me do these things. We're, we're hearing here tonight there's lots of people who haven't had that. So apart from community mentors standing up we, and not just educating the children, we have to try and educate the families as well so we all go on this walk together. Mm. Jenny, the thanks. Uh, the education department, I mean, do they have a role here with, with our kids? Well, I think, you know, every non-government organisation and government organisation have uh, a role. And I mentioned uh, a program before. Um, I think... At this end, and I, I know what Tanya was talking about and some of the gentlemen down here, I don't know, but um, people um, who are actually in that pattern already of violence, it's very difficult to know what can be done to assist them. Probably the uh, health uh, interventions that are being done by organisations like Congress um, and also what uh, some of uh, you have spoken about tonight might be of assistance, but for those that are brought up exposed to violence, we don't want young people to go into that pattern so they end up in the same situation where they have been exposed. So I do think education's got a very, very big role. There are some areas internationally where uh, very high rates of violence against women. The UN has programs of gender education, teaching people the benefits of equality, respectful relations, relationships, removal of harmful practices, including violence uh, from one to another. But I think what I'm hearing is that what people really seem to be looking for in Alice Springs is culturally based education programs, call it what you will. Uh, perhaps, I think these summits are fantastic, but perhaps, um, you know, uh, cultural programs that um, lead to transition to adulthood, uh, that those are the very cultural situations where uh, men and women uh, should be looking at teaching uh, young men, young women about respectful relationships in those very cultural situations. I believe that's where the oxytocin can come out very uh, uh, very well when it's a lot of people uh, sharing a similar culture or talking about the one thing. So that's what I'm hearing tonight and I think that's got to be looked at. Good, thanks, Jenny, thanks so much. Julie. Yeah, listen, um, uh, what I was thinking of Where's is that, that if oh, you yeah. want... Hmm? Sorry, I was waiting for Julie to talk, but you're fine. Where you go? 
Stuart. Oh, you can go. Yep. My, my middle name. Sorry, is no, Julie. you're right. <laughs> <laughs> No, Julie, you've probably got something better to say than I have, please. <laughs> Stuart. I'll be very brief, actually. Oh, that's Stuart, all right. thank you. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that comment made by that gentleman um, there about um, the, the different cultures in this town. You know, we have a lot of migrant people who work here. I, I do empl employ migrant workers from different countries, and you find that when um, people work together, those barriers break down and, and they, um, they have a, a a common goal to, to achieve. Um, education plays a very important role in this, um, in, the, in the predicament that, that we find ourselves in, because it not only uh, teaches self-esteem, self but respect for other people's cultures. And it's also a pathway to employment and financial security. And if people have financial security, that's one less reason for them to go out and get drunk and, and, um, and do what they do. Thanks, Julie. Ken? Um, we've got to uh, define education in regards to whether it's one, two, three, A, B, C, or who's who within the community that I am related to. Simple as that. And bilingual being a, a major part of it as well. Terrific. We'll get, we'll get down there, John. <coughs> We're on our way down, mate. Education <laughs> is very important, but as has been said, the cultural element is hugely important as well. But culture doesn't stand still. If you think of Irish culture, you probably think about fiddle playing and flute playing and so on. It's not that many hundreds of years since the fiddle was invented. So Irish culture didn't have the fiddle a long time ago, but it has now, and everybody dances to it on a Saturday night. So culture doesn't have to stand still. Culture can move forward and develop. And that's one of the challenges of the moment, it seems to me, is how to enable culture in the Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal community move forward into a respectful culture. But the other comment I'd like to make is in your area, Charlie, and that's in sport. It does seem to me that throughout the world, many First Nation communities have been able to find a way forward for their young men in particular, and for their older men to support them in developing skills and abilities in the sporting world. And I do sometimes wonder whether, in addition to looking to governments, to provide services. There might be some of the big sporting organizations and clubs might find it might be mutually beneficial to be putting their interest and their resources into developing in the Aboriginal community because in the long run, there could be some marvelous Aboriginal sportsmen representing this great country. Well, every sporting club, doesn't matter who they are, should have a culture of no violence against women. I mean, it should be what they stand for if you want to be part of that club. Donna. Um, yeah, look, I, I think I've made my views yep. clear about um, the importance of education and I wonder whether the doing, getting a good education uh, can actually be a tool for dealing with the issue of maintenance and survival of culture as well. So it's bringing them both together. Yep. Um, so I, I think that's something that, that we need to be uh, thinking about, that they're not mutually exclusive, but you can actually bring them both together. Mm. Yep. Okay. Stuart. What I, I just want to say about education really has nothing to do with culture or politics. There's, when children, uh, we know a great deal about how children think. And there are journals, for example, of mental, uh, infant mental health, mental health of children under one year of age. Computer science has enabled us to, to know what a child is actually thinking, so you don't have to guess a lot about it. And what we know is by age four, children are capable of not only walking in each other's shoes, but thinking in each other's shoes. And what I would suggest brings up a point you made, that children at a very young age can be taught to, to walk in other people's shoes by classroom activity and that that will make them aware of the existence of other people as separate beings and to take account for the importance of other people's viewpoints. Because what I'm hearing as an overall issue today is there's a clash of viewpoints and a lot of people are not listening to each other or they can't listen to each other for a variety of reasons. 
I think you can take a school, you can take children from a very young age and teach them to be reflective, to control affect, feelings, to empathize uh, in a way that normally children are not expected to be able to do until they were in their early 20s. Mm. That's new science, and I, I bet you could get that going in the school system. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, look, we're going to take, uh, we're just about out of time, and I, I, this is a conversation that could go on for days and weeks and months and years, and we know, we, we know that, but it's a good start tonight and some wonderful comments coming from the floor and the panel. Thank you so much for your comments, but we'll take one more comment from, Hello. from here, and I think it's fitting it's an Indigenous. Hello, I'm Rex Granitz, by the way, in Japaranka. About education, there's a lot that some of you, I point out the government, has not really done in a lot of areas. I feel some of us have been educated through your system and can speak in your words, in your language, but you can't speak in mine. I feel there's a lot that we have to learn from each other. Some of you aren't really ready to take that. I have worked with so many of you in education, mediations, and all that. And here I am still talking. I stood up with my dark hair. Now it's getting <laughs> rusty white. <laughs> I feel this is all my work that I was taught by my people the education that is called, and you said politician. Yes, we are the politicians in our own rights too. That's a language that is in us in Jokurpa. Jokurpa is a dreaming. It holds this, all this land. Some of you don't really know, some do. If you look at the Old Testament and the New, some of our missionaries are getting it all mixed up. It's still one book, a story. I feel, because I've been trained in ministry too, but my ministry was taught before that. I'm writing and interpreting it in a way that you and us all get to know. I'm sorry to say that is the truth that the government is not really talking about. Mm. Every so often we come to have these words spoken. It goes through the wind. It's not kept by two lots of governments. I feel I'm talking on behalf of my people here in Alice Springs, both black and white, I think it's time that the government of this time is our Christ. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rex. <laughs> Ladies and I'm going to call on uh, Des Rogers to, to close it uh, for you, but uh, thank you so much for your attendance tonight. Um, it could be the first step towards making a real difference. I'll just leave you with this thought. 80% of the uh, prison population is made up of Indigenous men. 80% of the children in the child protection investigation systems are Indigenous children. And if you take out CDEP, 80% unemployment is uh, what Aboriginal people face. And maybe there's a connection between the two. But what the world would look like for Aboriginal people if 80% of the university population were Aboriginal people. How great that would be. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for coming along tonight and listening and participating. Uh, we've got a young lady over there that's actually Donna's and my PA, Mara Pryor. Um, so she's been taking notes all night, so we'll collate all this. We've also got Chris Tanji here who's uh, filmed uh, the total night. We've got NITV here as well who have, uh, are probably going to make a 10-minute um, doco for the Awaken program hosted by Stan Grant. Uh, probably, which I think is on at 5.30 Friday nights. So it'll be on this Friday night, hopefully. So have a look. Look how beautiful you look. Um, but I also want to thank 
I want you to put your hands together to thank these young people. <laughs> so the two fellows are from Clontarf and the four young ladies are from the Girls Academy and they're certainly this town's future leaders. So. I'd also like to thank all the panel members for giving up their time, from some of them travelling thousands of miles, others just walking across the road. Um, but thanks very much. Um, <laughs> certainly like to thank uh, Bruce Looms, who's that fellow over there with folded arms, who's uh, pulled everyone together, um, and certainly the gentleman behind me who uh, came in at the last moment, uh, Charlie King, uh, who's a great uh, sports commentator, can, you know, talks about all sorts of sport. Um, but I think uh, his nickname used to be Banana Foot when he was a fella. He could, young fella, he couldn't kick a football, but he can certainly commentate. So, so outside we've got some uh, scones and tea and cake and that sort of stuff, uh, which is all healthy, because we're a healthy organisation. Um, so, and these people aren't going to run away, so please hang around and have a chat to everyone that's uh, here. So thanks very much again, everyone.